Car Blanche is a brand that I've seen everywhere. The hats, if you can picture them in your mind, they also have tees, hoodies, and some other products launched and on the way. It's a drop culture brand currently that might be changing. Tune in to find out. And he has done an incredible job bringing this brand to market, getting over 70,000 followers on Instagram and selling out most of his drops, which are now at number 10. And uh, he'll be talking about how and why he has done that. But he also owns a 3PL. He has also built Instagram pages to rival Justin Bieber and to rival some of the most popular celebrities of the time. He has also had multiple businesses in the past from selling fish all the way through to lemonade stands. He is a true entrepreneur and I believe he's only 24 years of age. But what really stuck with me from this podcast in particular is his optimism, blind optimism, if you will. He doesn't think about the negative consequences, which is a lesson that he taught me. And I really enjoyed reflecting on that after the show, because I think sometimes we reflect or pay too much attention to what could go wrong rather than what could go right. So that's something that I really took away with me. And uh, I hope you do too. This show is brought to you by Sendlane. Sendlane is the email SMS and reviews platform that is built for e-commerce specifically on a bed of modern technology with an incredibly powerful team behind them, they are going places. And if you're using something like Klaviyo or MailChimp, you really need to consider moving your stuff over to Sendlane. They'll help you. They have incredible deliverability. And all in all, the product they're offering and what they're doing is just, in my personal opinion, and a lot of other people's personal opinion, so much better than what is available on the market today. So go and check them out. There is a link in the show notes below and smash that event if you're going in a couple of weeks. This show is also brought to you by Rewind. I've preached Rewind for, well, ever since day one of this podcast. Get it on your store if you're serious about actually protecting your revenue and protecting your business because it allows you to have an undo button. That's important because you can undo things on your theme. Everyone knows that in Shopify, but you can't undo things like deleting data for products or images or videos or things like that. But what Rewind allows you to do is have a kind of all-encompassing undo button that you can just click if you make a mistake. It's so, so helpful when you need it. Uh, Just trust me on that. It's worth having on your store. And in addition, they offer a staging site. And I'm kind of getting tired of seeing people say, oh, we did this and it messed up our checkout on our live site. We did this and it messed up something for our customers. Or it, it can be avoided. Nine times out of 10, it can be avoided with a staging site. All that is is a copy of your live site. What you do is make all your changes on your staging site, test all your code, make sure there's no conflicts. There's a few great tools that will help you understand what's changed and if there's a problem. And then once you're happy, once you've done your quality assurance QA, you can push that to your live site. So you add that extra layer in and just make sure that nothing's going to mess up. And it can cost thousands when you mess something up like that if you don't pick it up straight away. So really worth looking at. Check them out below. On to today's show. I was like the lemonade stand kid. Um, three years old, like every day of the summer, I wanted to do a lemonade stand. My mom was like, you can't do it every day. Cause like you, only your neighbors are buying from you. It's kind of like, they feel the pressure to buy. So I would only be allowed to do it on certain days, but I did that. And then I started breeding fish when I was 11, 12, 13 years old. We had 25 fish tanks and some big fish tanks that I would put into the smaller ones, like the fish into there and breed exotic angel fish and sell them online. So I guess that was my intro into shipping because that's probably the hardest thing I've ever shipped is live fish. And then I started building Instagram theme pages early, um, right before going into high school, um, built up a huge network, released an app, Red Dots and Ball Spikes, which was just a $500 game salad template I bought. But since I had all the followers, I was able to make these really cringy ads. They were like best app in 2014 and it went number one paid app in the world. Kind of took that, transitioned. I wanted to start clothing, did like a Southern t-shirt brand. Didn't go great, but I learned That was maybe getting into e-commerce and then did a couple like small jewelry stores, stuff like that. Built the agency, kind of just followed the classic route, like DTC to agency, back to DTC. And then we started a 3PL. And then um, a year ago, last August, we launched Carte Blanche, which has been like the big success. But all that stuff before is what got Carte Blanche to kind of have the quick blow up that it did. Yeah, man. What's the rush? Like you've done like literally the journey, like you said, a lot of people do take a similar journey to that, but you did it in like a fraction of the time that people usually do it in. Did you just learn quick, fail fast and move on? Like what, what is it about you that allowed you to accelerate through all of those different phases in such a short space of time? 
I don't know if I've ever even thought of that because it feels long to me. Like I, I remember selling fish that seems like 20 years ago when in reality it was, I guess, 11 years ago or 12 years ago. But I guess failing fast has been has been what we've done. And there's also a lot of overlap, like the agency, we built it to where we thought the agency was big. And then we launched print your songs that went to $30,000 days within a week. And we just stopped the agency. Like we're like, Hey, to our media buyer, we're like, can you keep running the ads for the clients? But we're just not going to do this anymore. And you can help them. Cause we're like, just jump to the next. And then the three PL started why everything else was starting. And then carte blanche started why everything else was starting. So I guess a level of just failing fast and overlapping a lot of things at once. And just, if you're, um, if you need something done, you give it to a busy man. So I guess just staying busy and just getting things done really fast. Yeah. And did you, has it, did it happen in such a way that you, you had one opportunity and a better opportunity came along, you jumped? Was that how it felt to you? Yeah, but there was also a ton of failures. Like there's probably 10 LLCs that we've started in the last four or five years that never even got a sale for some of them. Some never even got a website. Like we figured out they were going to fail before, but we put a lot of time into them. But they just didn't make it. So I guess also the the mag, the uh, amount of things that we've tried over over the last decade. And then, by the way, when I say we, I'm always talking my business partner Adam Wilbanks. We do we do everything together. Like if he starts something, it's part. If I start something, we're both part of it. And so we've built all these brands together. We've we've been working together um, since 2016. He dropped out of college, I think, the first time. Maybe 2017. Maybe 2016. Moved down had to move back home. We kept failing, moving back home until we finally started to figure it out. But, but we've done everything together for the last, uh, whatever that is eight years, nine years now. So what's the, what's the, I will start here. What, what's the goal? Like at the moment where you are, what are you envisaging is the goal because it's not difficult. Uh, sorry. It is very difficult, right? This isn't an easy life. Yeah. So what, what's your end game? Yeah. It sounds ridiculous, but I want carte blanche to be a billion dollar brand. And, and I think that the great, like, that's really hard to do. But one of the coolest things is I I'm 24 now, Adam's 28. So we have the rest of our lives to, to achieve that. And I think a lot of the time when you do set to go run a billion dollar company, usually those people are in their forties or fifties. So we have 20 more years of learning stuff. And although that's a massive goal, that's, that's the goal. And what what does that mean to you to be a billion dollar brand? Is it just a simple monetary figure, but or does that give you some sense of uh, establishing something real in the world? Like what what significance does being a billion dollar brand hold for you personally? I think it, it, it's not about the money because at the end of the day, like a couple million bucks will be fine, like for the rest of your life, and I don't really care about the money like that at all. But if we're able to build a billion dollar brand, in my mind, that's where you have like the 100,000 square foot warehouses around the whole world. You have the massive amount of employees and, and you really like in the game of entrepreneurship, like even 100 million, like that's a massive company too. Of course it is. 10 million is massive. But if you can get to a billion, billion dollar company in your entrepreneurial journey, you kind of like check the box off as a, as a great entrepreneur. And I don't think that I want to just be like, a decent entrepreneur. I want to take it all the way as high as it goes. And, and that's like the level in my head of like, okay, you were an entre- a really good entrepreneur. And that might sound like ridiculous, but I mean, I've been thinking like that since I was in high school. So you, and you, you run a 3PL as well at the same time, right? And a lot of people would say, chase two hairs, catch none. It's a saying over here. But I understand from just chatting to people that running a 3PL is a pretty specific set of skills and, you know, application of resource and running a brand is a kind of separate set of skills. Uh, A lot of brands obviously outsource their uh, shipping to a 3PL. So I was really interested to understand a bit more about how you've ended up running a 3PL and being a brand, which is essentially just doing your own warehousing, I guess, plus doing it for others. Uh, and why you continue to do that? Are you just waiting for that jump off like you did with the agency to focus on the brand entirely? Or have you got another strategy in play? Yeah, I, I've, I've thought about this a lot recently because in all honesty, right now, carte blanche gets 10% of my time and 10% of Adam's time. And I can't imagine what will happen when we can give it 100% of our time. 
but it's also a drop based brand right now. So every six weeks is like really hot periods when we're, we call them like in season, off season. And so like right now we just got out of a drop. So we're building the next one, but it's kind of more design based than admin and, and getting the clothes and producing them and all that. But it does get really busy. The three PL did come first and the, the three, first off carte blanche and the three PL were our brands that, that we are really building without taking money out of right now. Um, Carte Blanche is getting pretty profitable, so we might, but our Plax brand, the Print Your Songs and Print Your Places brands were kind of like what we've been living off the last last couple of years. And that was the first one. So building that built the 3PL and the 3PL was directly like completely helped keep the Plax band, brand running. And then having the 3PL on the back, it just built out and they kind of complement each other. But it is a lot of work and the goal is to be out of the 3PL in the next year or two where I'm not doing day to day and we have a, a CEO running that and then I can fully focus on carte blanche. But it is hard and I, if I could set it up differently, I wouldn't do them at the same time because it's a lot of day to day, but it's something that has to happen and I'm not going to back out of it. And is that because you want to bootstrap these brands? You don't want to take on any investment if, if it was available? Yeah, bootstrapping is is just kind of what we know in cash flow. Like there's been times where we have different credit cards and and different um different bank accounts with different sort of money and I'm I'm like feeling like a wizard like moving it to get us through like tougher periods especially <laughs> back in the print your songs days like if I pay on this visa it's not due to, and then this Amex is due here and we've just bootstrapped it it's like the only thing I know is is to just figure out how to get the payments done and not take on money. So why did you choose e-commerce? What is it about e-commerce that attracts you? Huh. I don't think it necessarily was like a decision I made consciously. I just, the whole drop shipping thing became, like I was just in the group of people, kind of how Twitter is now. I've, there's been a bunch of business Twitter uh, profiles for a long time and people started talking about Shopify drop shipping. And I was like, I'll just try that out. And it kind of turned to that, but I fell in love with What's crazy is I fell in love with, it kind of makes sense. It's my first time saying it. Seeing all the packages on the floor for my first brand. I was like, now this is awesome. Like you're seeing a, a tangible with apps. You're seeing numbers on the, on the screen of download charts. But with, with shipping, you see those boxes and you can look at all the labels and see where they're going all around the world. And I just fell in love with that being like, look at all these packages. And there's a tangible, like I can see these orders coming in and see them going out and then see their Instagram posts of them happy with their product. And and that was that was just the biggest shot of dopamine to me. And I guess with the three PL too, when I go out there and see three thousand packages going out that day, I'll be like, "This is awesome! Like we're doing something cool here. Like we're sending these out to all these people." And and then I think that's pretty cool. So I think the the tangible side of the shipping is what I fell in love with most is like seeing all those packages with the drops. And the effort that's going into the minute and finite details that are coming with those drops. That's a labor of love there. Um, is that coming from you? Is that coming from your business partner or your team as a whole? It, it's just me and Adam are, but yeah, the, there's a complete love for the brand and every little like periods in an Instagram caption and commas in an Instagram caption and the tiniest little details that are in there. We just, we just stress crazy because we both truly believe that branding death is by a million little cuts. We saw a video about that and, and it really stuck to us. And so we just focus on every little detail and it's, it can get annoying and might be like, oh, like, let's just finish up this edit. And I would hate to be one of our designers when we like are changing like the tiniest little font and you can't even tell the difference. But to us, we know that every little thing that we stress right now that won't scale when we get bigger, but maybe if we can stress it now and then put it into the people that we bring on, the new, new employees, new designers, it'll grow throughout the top line of carte blanche as it expands and then trickle down so that we can actually do this for a long, long time. But yeah, it's, it's complete mm -hmm. love and passion and it doesn't, it doesn't, um, like I don't hate doing it at all. I love every bit of it, every second of it going to do like, driving to Atlanta, which isn't bad, but for where I'm from, it can be like an hour drive to pick up shirts. And it's like, why am I doing that right now? I don't have time to be doing it, but I'll, I'll make it happen just because I want to see the product first. Like I'm, I want to be the guy to see the first shirts printed and, and it's just complete love for it. And I saw the picture of you filling up your car with boxes of the drop. 
<laughs> so you're just keeping is that how you how you track inventory based on on uh, your literage of the boot yeah we we pick up all the printed stuff and the hats that are embroidered here some are now the newer ones that we're making are in china and have the custom tape and all of that going on um but yeah i picked i dropped off all the first few rounds of shipments because they fit in my car but then on the Black Friday drop, I believe, we had to rent a U-Haul, and then we realized that wasn't going to work, so we knew I should do a deal for all the drops since then with UPS they pick up. But every single order um, that's made in the U.S., I pick up. Personally, I QC every single hat we ever have, like hold it physically in my hand and, and make sure there's no extra strings or make sure that the bill's not bent or anything like that so that everyone that, that gets the their product, especially if they're paying that higher price point, is going to get what they pay for and not get a defected product. Give us something that's going to give us a bit of a flavor as to who you are so we can just get to know you a bit better. Wow, that's a, that's a big question. This is good. I, I don't do a lot of this deep reflecting back, but I probably should do more of it. I think, I mean, of course, I want to instantly go to like some sort of monetary thing that happened, but I really don't think that was like those, those moments all come to mind. The first one that came to mind is when I sold my first Instagram page for like a thousand dollars or fourteen hundred dollars um, in eighth grade, going into my freshman year of college or high school, I I sold that and I took it to order all the pieces to build a, a gaming computer, I guess you'd call it at the time. But I ordered all the pieces online. Spent like I think I overspent like four or five dollars. My dad had to order like the last small little thing for me. But I built that whole computer from from every little piece. And I sat there for hours building it with the money that I had earned. And I turned it into something that was going to be like the foundation to, to do, to build more, more businesses and brands. Um, and, and I think that was a big moment for me as I saw, I worked hard for a whole summer and then turned it into the next thing. I completely invested every penny back into the next thing. And I, I think that was a, a big moment in my entrepreneurial like kickstart. How old were you there? That was eighth grade summer going into my freshman year of high school. So I guess that's 13 or 14. It was before the apps. It, it was the kickstart that started the apps. There's a photo on my Twitter that'll have me. My dad took a photo of me next to the computer and, and that one got a lot, like 700, 800 likes on Twitter. So that one, I'm going to, you can go find that afterwards maybe and put it in here or I'll send it to you. Um, but yeah, it was always like that. My dad said he's a big runner, which kind of came down to me too. I'm a big runner as well, but he would run when I was a, a baby. He put me in like the running stroller and he worked for a company at the time, Home Depot. And, and if you're a runner, especially pushing a cart, you know how hard it is to talk while you're running. And he said that he would like, when he would take me, he knew it was going to be a hard run because I would ask him open-ended questions like, how does Home Depot make money and why do they do this? And I also would like read off every single mailbox number we passed by. I would just read it out loud to him. And like, I was obsessed with the numbers. And I was way too young to be asking how Home Depot makes money, but but he always tells me about that story that I just had the the click. And even with the lemonade stands, I remember being super young and I would tell my neighbor Carter, I would say, Hey, I'll give you all the stuff if you go put your stand on that side of the street and I'll put my stand on this side of the street. And then at the end of the day, I'll give you half the money you make, which is just young entrepreneurship. Way too young to be doing that. I imported uh, a bulk import of products into Shopify and I did not put in the meta fields the created date and uh, that sent the whole filtering system haywire because you could no longer filter by collect filter collections by newest in first uh, or, or date added to the website which was a really big problem for this quite large fashion brand. If I didn't have Rewind, that would have been a complete pickle. It would have taken hours, if not days, to sort out all of the while these products are live and really messing up their merchandising. A mistake by me, absolutely. But fortunately, I had the foresight to install Rewind before I made any of these changes. And I was able to just click a button, restore the site back to a previous version just a few minutes before I made that fatal error and no one was any the wiser. That's the value of Rewind. That's just one use case, okay? One use case. There are hundreds of other use cases. Have it on there because when you need it, you'll text me or you'll tweet me and say, thank you so much, Finn, for recommending that I install Rewind. You saved my bacon. Back to today's show. So wait, let me ask you this then. So if you've got this inbuilt uh, kind of navigation system for making money, do you, do you have an emotional attachment to it? You said you've had some wins and you've had some losses. Do the losses make you feel 
bad? Do you feel down? Do you build yourself up about it? And do the wins, do you feel like insane and you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe how good this is? Or are you pretty level-headed with the whole thing? I'm just interested to know, like, what's your mentality around business in general? I think the emotional baseline is really important is to keep close, which, which can co- leak problems into other parts of my life. But I try to keep the lows close to the middle and the highs close to the middle. Um, there hasn't been, there's been a lot of really scary moments and it hasn't just like, I know that a lot of people wouldn't like to try to handle those losses. And I kind of just know that that means something great's about to happen. Like me and Adam will joke about it too. Is When something starts going really bad, we're like, oh, it's about to get really good because the air always goes back before it goes forward. But every single time something's gotten really bad, it just moves around the stuff to see the new door that's about to open. And, and I guess it might be that mindset that we have on that, but it always seems to happen. And then when things are going really good, there's been a lot of times that I've like kind of slacked up a little bit. So now I know when things are going good, like double, triple, quadruple down, because it, nothing stays good for a long time. It has to have those highs and lows. So we just don't even really focus on the goods being the goods at the moment. Just keep doubling and just keep going all in on it. So there's not a lot of time to really reflect on it. But yeah, we'll go have like a nice dinner or something. We just did that the other day after the drop, but right back to work the next day. Where do you think your like appetite for risk comes from? I don't know, man. I just, I don't really think about the bad stuff. And I, I, I guarantee most of it has to do with my parents. Like we had a nice upbringing. Um, I kind of saw my dad grind up through like the corporate ladder and, and watched how like, life kind of changed, especially, and it wasn't when I was super young, it was like when I was 13, things got a lot better. And I, so I watched how he did it, but they also did a really good job of per, not over protecting me from things, but also letting me know that things are always going to be okay. So in my mind, like things are always going to be okay, no matter what, <laughs> like I, I don't, I'm not too nervous of, of losing it all. And I've also had to move home before and Adam's had to move home before. And sometimes that's fun. So I'm just, I care more about just keep building something cool than the monetary value because you can usually always figure that out one way or another, especially as your reputation grows. Like you can make a couple phone calls with your network and and figure something out here and there if you need to be. I want to get kind of deep into the pre-brand stage. So I want to understand first where the idea even came from to move into fashion uh, or even to look at this industry. Where was that born? Come here. One sec. Oh, Say, yeah. Dogs, they just hurt something. But um, that I, Carte Blanche was a plan that we had way before we launched it. We knew we wanted to get into hats specifically and shirts specifically. And, and we watched some brands build this drop-based model and, and we were really fascinated with it. I was huge on the reseller market um, when Yeezys were blowing up and, and shoes like that. So I was always obsessed with watching people line up for a website and, and wait there to have a chance to buy your product. That's just so fascinating to me. So, so we knew we wanted to get into a drop-based model and we talked about it on and off for a couple of years. And then in February of 2022, we had a really good um, Valentine's Day um with with our with our brands so we we had a little bit of extra money we could use and and we talked to one of our friends he said start it now while you have cash flow so you don't sell the brands and have no cash flow and then you're trying to build it off of nothing so we went ahead and decided to start um building it and i'd already been playing with some names but i really took the next couple months um i really took the next couple months going through the dictionary every night on my computer just clicking trying to find a word because we knew it needed to be something like people could read and, and say and not just like X, Y, Z, three, four, five. Like it needed to be like a, a name that had a billboard to it where people would like it and it had to mean something really cool. And we also wanted it to have some sort of French ties. And so I would go through and just click every night for a couple hours or every other night <laughs> until I found carte blanche. Let's, let's just pause there for a second. How frustrating is doing that exercise. I can't. I love, no, I loved it. I was I was putting no. words into like business generators and trying to yeah. find like maybe if I could find these two words together, 
and I loved it. And I remember texting Adam Carp launch and he'd never even heard the word. I didn't even, I don't even think I'd heard the word. I maybe heard it, but didn't know what it mean. And he's like, yeah, but it needs, it needs to like be like mean something actually. Like it can't just be two random French words. And I was like, no, look what it means. And then he was like, Oh, and I was like, Oh, <laughs> and then we had the, we started getting the logos made the very next day, but that was probably, so from February to May, I was doing that every night, and then we started building the samples and stuff in May. And, and what was it? it what, what did it almost become? What was it? Beyond, beyond Saints. It was almost Beyond Saints. You know, we have the brand of um, called All Saints. That's very, very famous. Yeah, if that, that's why it felt too close. To All, all Saints mm. was one of my favorite brands, actually. And there's a lot of inspiration um, from them in Carte Blanche, but it was almost Beyond Saints. But that just felt too close playing with a lot of words like hate, love, fear, like trying to build some sort of cool thing that was like unbound by fear. So not being fearful. And, and that was almost one of our, one of our taglines. There's a lot of things we played with, but when we heard Carte Blanche, it was like again, within it, we instantly knew that was the brand. And when we saw it laid out here and we even put the check signature line in here, it, it just all played perfectly. And then Dove is the symbol of freedom. So create, um, why did I just blank? Uh, Carte Blanche means complete freedom. So to have the dove for complete freedom with the brand name inside of it, it all just played perfectly. And and there, and then we also have the check. So this is the 009. It looks like a, I don't know, it looks weird there, but to have the 009 and check font on the back. So we were able to really play with the brand name throughout all branding aspects. And and that's that was really, really a big win for us, I think, is having a, a brand name like that. Talk us through your first inventory order and subsequent drop and the marketing that went behind it. Mm -hmm. hmm. We didn't know anything. <laughs> we really didn't. Um, we had no, we really, like I tested, I ordered samples from all the blank suppliers of all t-shirts and hats and watched every YouTube video of how to start a clothing brand. Like even Was though I- the US? Were you only sampling the US or did you go overseas? To sell or to sample? It, both. So, so we, we started off only selling in the U.S. because we didn't have um, international shipping yet. But for sampling, I, I don't – I know that all of the blank suppliers were in the U.S., but I think some of the blanks were made overseas. But for yeah. embroidery and screen printing, the, the only goal was to have it within a driving distance of my house so I could go see samples as soon as they were done. Because I knew how fast we were going to have to be if we we're going to do drop-based brands, that it, there was not going to be extra time for shipping and stuff like that. So I was trying to find a good blank supplier for the t-shirt and a good blank supplier for the hat, which I found, and then a good screen printer and embroidery place close to my house. And I kind of found all three of those pretty fast, but then we had to do a lot of sampling before, before we wanted to launch because it had to be perfect off the first one. And, and for the launch strategy, we... We didn't run any Facebook ads. We we boosted the posts on Instagram, but um, we only had the the entire drop was eight thousand ish dollars, and it sold out in an hour, which is not massive um, compared to where it is now. But it was a big stretch at the time. We had we got to four thousand followers, but what we did really good that we had no clue we were really doing or knew how important it was going to be as we told everyone from the start, it was going to sell out quick. We like, we like started that perceived value of the, if you get this, it's going to be rare. It's going to be the only one. Um, I think this will be the only drop with them on this numbers on the hats. So they'll never be an 001 hat again. Um, and it's going to sell out. And, and then we launched the site, not knowing if our sizing was right, our inventory was right or anything, but people showed up like two or 300 people. And it, and it sold out and we we're like, oh, wow, it worked. But, but one of the biggest tricks we did was telling people it was going to sell out and making a really good product that we sampled and didn't just. So everyone that got their product loved their product. And that kickstarted the crazy repeat customers that we have. So how did you keep the suppliers to, you know, engaged with you, I guess? Or was that never yeah. I, so I found the place that I ended up going with locally was smaller than a massive place. But the biggest thing was convincing them we were going to be big. So I'm like, I know you're losing money right now sampling these hats. And I know this, but here's kind of my track record. 
I know this is going to work. Please just bear with me. And, and I, I'm, I'm pretty good about not asking too much out of people. And I, I tried never, I, I don't think I've ever yelled at anyone. <laughs> like, to be honest, I'm a, I'm a pretty well-tempered guy. So I, I just stayed really nice with, to them and was like, Hey, like whatever needs to happen. Like if we have to pay a hundred bucks for this hat, we will, but just please bear with us and we will use you. And, and now we, I mean, we have to be their biggest client. It's, it's, it's massive every six weeks. Um, but they bared with us and they were younger too, which was nice for this place. They're actually a year younger than me and they're crushing it, um, building out their screen printing and embroidery place. But so they, this must have crossed your mind. Sorry to interrupt. This must have crossed your mind. Just knowing your personality for the 43 minutes we've been chatting, you must have thought about just buying a screen printer and an embroidery machine, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still think of it. But it's, it, <laughs> it's, it's such a different skill set and and such a different we'd have to hire people that know how to run those and then the quality control that they do there is still high and i still pull stuff out so if i was doing both sides i feel like we'd sell no shirts like i feel like i would just not like any shirt and be like this ink is off by an inch so i would rather them quality control them and, and reprint them and, and spend the time on it and and us kind of stay out of it but eventually we will go overseas on everything and, and that's when your quality control can blow up, but also get really good if, if you communicate to your supplier property, like every hat has to be this way or don't ship it. And then we'll still do quality control here. But mm -hmm. yeah, I've thought of it, but I just don't think I can, I don't think, I, I don't think I, it's a good idea for me to screen print and border. That would really draw it thin. I would have no time. Yeah, probably a smart move. Um, what do you think about the amount you put into your first drop in terms of cash in, I think you said 8,000? Does that include the marketing? Does that include everything that you put that in? Was the that was the revenue. That was the revenue. We blew. Oh, we revenue. just blew. so we also pumped money into it. Like we were no cut, cut no expenses, which is was a huge plus on our side that we were able to do that. Um, we didn't start it off with a budget in mind or tracking anything, which now we're like every, our spreadsheets are massive for every little like like we know how much it costs to get a like on a post, how much every little tag costs, every little stitch. Um, but in the beginning we did it, we purposely, I would say I was purposely Adam probably was just too busy because he does all of our book, like all of our finances and stuff and, and builds the spreadsheets. He's a wizard with it. But I purposely was just swiping the MX. I was just like, we're going to not cut any expense. We're going to make sure everyone has the nice box. Everyone has the nice uh, match box with their order, the nice stickers and the, the logo will be perfect. And it's going to have the puff print and the quality is going to be great. And we're going to gain as many followers as possible. So we just pumped money into it to make sure that the demand was there. And so we didn't get profitable until drop four or five. We, we kept that mindset and we also had the, the back debts from the first drops. But, but we probably spent, we had to have spent more than double on the first drop that we made. Had to have. Yeah. But, you know, I think there's, when you speak to founders, there's two types. There's the spreadsheet builders and then there's the brand builders. And I do hey. think they're defined quite clearly. And you look at anyone like Ghost Nutrition represent brand builders or, you know, and then there's any number of uh, spreadsheet builders and they're building different businesses. So I get why you would do that. And yeah, uh, why I would definitely say with me and Adam, he's also a brand builder as well, but I'm not a spreadsheet guy as well. Like he is our guy with, with making that stuff. And, and I get really excited and I build really fast and I just start going and he's good at being like, okay, slow down. Like he, he brings it back to the middle, but I just want to go like, that's what I am. I can talk and I can sell and, and I can, uh, I can come up with a cool idea and, and run it up or run it down really fast. So we're a really good balance between the two of us. So presumably let's fast forward a bit. Presumably now you're investing a little bit more into, can you give us a rough idea how much you're investing into inventory? Like it doesn't have to be exact, but just into, is it three figures, four figures, five figures for each drop now? Yeah, each drop now is um, it's it's so much bigger than it was in those first ones. But I'm trying to think of a a number without giving a number. We we sold over a thousand orders last drop, and our our average order value is over a hundred dollars. Um, and then this next drop will probably be closer to fifteen hundred orders, I believe. So we're we're scaling. We kind of do two drops the same size back to back, and then do a big jump two back to back, and do a big jump so that we can um, not overgrow because in the beginning we were just growing super fast and we went a little too hard on Black Friday, which was way too early. Um, so now we try to like just be a little more patient and back to back, same size and then grow. 
So last drop and the drop before, so eight and nine were about the same size, and then 10 will be a much bigger drop. And then we will jump again because 11 will be Black Friday, and that's Black Friday. So, so they're much bigger now, but, but still growing. And what about product diversification? Drop one, what was dropped, and what was your most recent drop? Yeah, drop one was three hats, all classic hats. So it was a black one, a green bill cream top, which has become like our staple color, the green, and then a tan, um, a tan golf type hat, and then two or three t-shirts, maybe three, or two des- three designs, four total colors or something, pretty small. Um, and then the last drop was eight or nine hats and eight or nine shirts. So getting a lot bigger, but we'll have hoodies now. We can bring those back because it's getting cooler. We'll bring back our sweatshirts, our socks, and try to expand into um, some cool stuff for next summer. We'll start getting some really cool cut and sew, like bowling tees and um, collared shirts and stuff like that. Nice. So how do one thing I be I mean, I'd love to know how you do it if you have a formula, but how do you sell something that has no, uh, how do you sell fashion? How do you create hype? Because you did it. Um, where do you think that comes from in terms of being able to essentially sell a hat, but with the brand from day one, how do you think you generated that initial demand and then kept that momentum and built on that momentum? What would you say that comes down to? What's what I've noticed a lot of people talking about when they talk about what Carte Blanche did with that, they don't talk about the designs as much as like the marketing and the way that we draw people to the landing page and and how we execute that. And I think that was a big part of it. Like we made sure we got the got people's contact and got them to buy in fast. Like they had to follow the Instagram. You had to give us your email. You had to give us your phone number if you went on the page. So we were able to contact you and let you know. Then I think designs, like we made cool stuff. It wasn't stuff people didn't want to wear. And it was people complimented people when they were wearing it because people hadn't really seen anything like this. So people wearing it and getting a compliment, they wanted more. So I think that helped. But one of the, another thing that I, that is really massive is me and Adam are completely sold on the idea. And you can feel that through the way we put captions on the Instagram, how we post about it on our personals, how we tweet about it, and and how the photo shoots are are done and and I guess choreographed or whatever you'd say for the photo shoot. But we were completely, completely all in on it. And anyone that came around us with a negative tone, we would be upset with. Like they're like, I don't know. Am I you not you sure that's not too many hats or you think that design's going to sell? It's like, no, do not say that. Like we are all in and we fully believe everything we're doing. And I think that just transcended through the brand. You are in the D2C space. If you have a brand that's selling online and you haven't at least had a demo with Sendlane, then one of two things is objectively true about you. You like setting money on fire. You like making your life more difficult. If neither of those things are true and you are an e-commerce brand and you are selling online, you do send emails, you do send SMS, you do have reviews or at least like to collect reviews, then there is no reason for you not to at least have had a demonstration with Sendlane. They are built for e-commerce. They are the most modern platform with the best features, in my opinion, at the lowest cost. I mean, I'm not really sure what would be holding you back please go and check them out. Show notes below, they have an event coming up. You can still get tickets, I believe, for that event in San Diego. A link to the Commerce Roundtable in the show notes below as well. Please do go and check out Zenland if you haven't already. Back to the episode. I agree. I absolutely agree. And what are you going to do next? Like In terms of scaling this brand up, it sounds like you're being sensible with your growth rate. Is that something that you are actively tracking? And what's your kind of strategic um plan for growing the brand are you doing it in such a way that you're just reinvesting all of your cash flow back into the next drop and you're just trying to build it and build it and build it is that is that how you're moving it forwards yeah um i guess this will be like a little early access no one knows but around cyber monday we'll go to a daily sales model with the the paid for daily collection which will have some of our best sellers available at all times 
and we'll we'll tone down the drop level like we did nine drops in the first year. We'll make them much bigger drops with a more spaced out period, so they'll be more intricate while having the daily sales model going. And I think having the daily sales model is the key to to really expanding it because right now there's only a couple thousand people in the world wearing carte blanche and and although we don't want everyone to wear a carte blanche and the brand isn't made for everyone we we do want people that want a hat really bad to be able to get a hat and wear it um the price point will still be a higher price point and and only going up over time but we'll go to the daily sales model and that's that's kind of the next big step and then making our drops much more intricate which we need more time to do. We can't do that every six weeks. We need a few months to do that. So that's the plan for next year. And now you've done this playbook or you've run this playbook so far, would you recommend it to others, i.e. this kind of um, starting small with drop-led um, product to market and then building up, building up to a point where you've got an established core base that you can then, like you said, activate that some of those daily drivers and still continue the drop base model is that now would you do that the same if you were starting over today yeah although i don't think i i think i could do it again but i don't think it would ever hit the crazy way that carte blanche did i think a lot of that was the name and 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 the first time doing it we we were doing whatever it took like thanksgiving day i was with, I took my dad from Thanksgiving lunch and me and him and picked up shirts and hats to clean them and put them in bags and get them ready for the drop on Black Friday and, and a lot of that just crazy hungry stuff. But I, I, I know that if we gave the playbook to people on how to do it, they could execute it if they, if they followed it perfectly because I've helped some people with hats and they, they've been selling a ton. Um, but the biggest thing is just being patient and not rushing your brand to try to get to a certain number of sales. But, just being slow and and, and really um, meticulous with what you're doing and not trying to speed up the process. I mean, we're still so, so, so small and we're still trying to stay slow and not just try to make, take a huge grab on some number value of sales and just keep it tight so that we don't overgrow. What do you think your biggest threats are uh, right now? What's the biggest threat to the business? Mm. See, I don't. That's my problem. I don't think negative stuff like that. Like, I, I think don't, that's a problem. I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, I could get blindsided, but I don't think as long as we keep doing what we're doing, I think it's going to keep going great. Um, a, a threat would be like a massive when we switch over to cut and sew in China, like maybe like a container or something getting lost at sea. That's something that we have to plan on now. Yeah. Um, like a. You're not worried about cash flow. You're not worried about any of those sorts of uh, traditional plagues that come with e-commerce. No, the cash flow stuff that could be a problem. When we try to expand to daily sales, and and we've thought of maybe maybe taking some funding routes. But I think we should be okay. Um, also, with the idea that we're not trying to rush it and make this huge number, that we're fine slowing things down a little bit if need be. Um, even though we are doubling down, why it's good and that's important. Like when I say slow down, I mean maybe we 1.5x instead of 2x. But but we know the demand's there, and it's also like the Ferrari, the old Ferrari um, model, which was make if the demand was 100%, make 90% because those 10% of people that can't buy are going to promote the heck and tweet about it and post about it because they can't get it. So if we're a little under the demand always, that's that's kind of the goal. Yeah, that does make um, people crazy when they can't get hold of things. I hate that, yeah. but then I love it at the same time. It kind of brings you close to the brand. Um, then when you finally time, get it, you're, you're much more like happy to have it. It's more valuable to you. You're more sticky as well, I think. You're more, you're more proud to own it, and then you're more hungry to own the next piece, in my opinion. Yeah, our, you... our repeat customer yeah. rate's ridiculous. It's, yeah. it was 20, every time we expand and get bigger, the repeat customer rate's still high and then grows because it only can get as big as, as we have available. But our repeat customer rate last drop was 30 something percent. And the one before was 22 percent when we doubled from the one before. So we're bringing in all these new customers and our repeat customer rate is still crazy high. But, but I think once we go to the daily sales model, it'll, it'll get really big. Yeah, I think about uh, new brands, especially, especially in fashion, as tribes. And I think about customers as nomads looking for tribes. And when you're bringing a brand to market, what you're advertising is 
being part of a tribe and then what you advertise, your products, your brand messaging, your brand equity is, you know, what represents your tribe. And then people vote whether to be part of your tribe or not. And then you get that kind of momentum and the tribe grows bigger and you keep ticking the boxes. And then at some point you become a village and then you become a town, then you become a city. And um, it's about maintaining that core ethos of the tribe. But it seems that a lot of people are joining your tribe right now. But then also if you turn people away, you know, we're like, I'm not taking any new members of our tribe right now. It's kind of, you can boil it back down to some basic human instincts, in my opinion. Um, that's my that's my favorite thing in in the world is is um is the people that are on carte blanche right now they're sh- they really know about the brand they just make a random order they they were there at four p.m. Eastern time on that Tuesday to order and they got it they're not so they know about the brand and when people see people out in places like last night for example my friends were um I always get I'll just get texts. Like, I don't know if you will see this, just text my friends, two people with carte blanche hats. And I got two of those just last night, someone wearing a shirt. So when people see people wearing carte blanche or someone owns carte blanche and see someone wearing carte blanche, they always go up and talk to each other. And that's, that's really cool. So I, right now we're like a street or like a neighborhood. It's really tiny, but everyone is, is so, so aware of what they have or that what carte blanche is that they talk and become friends with each other. And, and that's probably one of my favorite things about the brand. What feels better, selling out your drops or when you get messages like that? That messages like that. Like we we if we didn't if a drop we overproduced and didn't completely sell out and we had to sit on some stuff, which we have when we were earlier, we cut some stuff off early. Um, but that that would be no problem to us. But seeing people wear it and happy wearing it, like seeing it when I see a hat out in public, I feel like a like I want to freak out. And I try to act cool because I try to be unbiased. So I, I don't even tell most people that I'm the brand owner. I'll just be like, do you like, how'd you hear about that? Like, that's a cool hat. I have one too. And they're like, oh yeah, da, 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 da. And they're like, I love it. And that's the, that's by far the greatest feeling in the world. But I don't go up to them and be like, oh, I own that. I'm like, uh, that's a cool hat. How'd you like, how'd you hear about it? Tell me about it. And then hearing that, that's, that's what it's all about right there. As you grow this brand up, what are some of the red flags you're thinking about that you're like, I'm not going to make that mistake? Maybe it's going into wholesale retail. Maybe it's using a high caliber influencer for a one shot deal. Like, are there any things that you're like, nah, I know I've learned from someone else. I'm not doing that. I'd, so we don't pay any influencers. They all reach out to us or sometimes we'll reach out to them, but we're never going to pay an influencer because I don't. In my mind, if someone gets paid to wear something, they don't actually love it. So when we send it to an influencer and they ask for it, 99% of the time, they'll wear it and post it and tag us. But if we send it to them, they don't wear it. It's just they didn't love it. And that doesn't hurt our feelings, but we didn't pay for that that post. So we'll never pay influencers. Also, we've never, we'll never never do a discount code. Maybe like something cool on Black Friday where like you can get two of something or or like buy three hoodies together for like a lower value. But we'll never be like 15% off the website, stuff like that. We will stay far away from that because of where we're trying to go. Or last year for Black Friday, what we did is first 75 orders got a free hat that we have because we always have a couple leftover hats for buffers in case people need to return or sometimes someone will like stain their hat or something and, and we'll try to help them out with that. So we had 75 extra hats last Black Friday and shipped them out the first orders. And we'll do stuff like that, but never do like a straight like join our email list for 10% off. That's That's not our goal is to discount our product because we know the value of it. So I guess those are the two, two main red flag things. And then never try to go too fast, like just being content with where it's going and understanding it's, it's death by a million little cuts. So if you speed things up and keep doing things bad over and over, little small things will kill the whole brand. Um, so I think about that a lot, like why did it, like, why do people stop buying Yeezys as much? And, and when did things stop being cool to wear? Like, I don't want that to be carte blanche where it's not a cool thing to wear anymore. So just keeping that in mind always. Represent a brand that I'm very fond of. We've had George on the show. They're a very, very high fashion, high quality, wouldn't discount brand equity over everything brand. But a few times a year, they open up on their website something called The Vault. And in The Vault, they do discounted items for a set period of time. Then The Vault closes and you know there's never anything that's quite recent on there. But I'm trying to work out like one of the biggest problems that you've just mentioned for a brand like yourselves that is all about building brand equity is how do you clear old inventory if you do, you know, overorder or, you know, things like that, because that's 
capital tied up, right? And mm-hmm. then I was looking at all of these these crazy things that people seem to be doing now with these like boxes and things like that. And you see them in sneaker stores, right? Where you have like a vending machine full of sneakers. And then there'll be like, uh, you know, one of those key games where you have to like, you can win the sneakers, but it's like $20 to have a go at it, but there'll be Yeezys in there. I'm like, this yeah. is super smart, right? They're just, so I wonder if there's ever going to be like a kind of fusion of this style of gamification where mm. you're not really actually giving away a discount, but ultimately you can play with the numbers to work out, okay, one in every 10 boxes is going to win a hat. So an entry is $10. So it's hundred dollars to win a hat means we sell a hat. And I just wonder, have you looked into any ways that you could liquidate your stock? Should you need to? Well, first of all, George is a huge inspiration for me. I've, I've watched when I was building the brand, I was watching every documentation I could find on YouTube of him and, and watch his tweets and Instagram stories. And he's done a really good job of building the brand slowly. And so I model a lot off of him. Like he didn't cut corners and just kept doing it every single day. So he's a big inspiration, but, um, and I do, the vault is a big thing that we've looked into too. I love how they do that. Um, but on black Friday, we had, we went too heavy on hoodies. We were too, we were smaller than we thought we were. And we trying to jump the gun and I'm glad we learned early, but we had a, t- we had a good bit of hoodies left over. Um, but we sold it out because, uh, we don't want to keep anything open longer than, than the day it was. So we, we sold it out. But what we did is, is on the next drop, the black hoodies, with the same hoodie, but we stitched over it and made it like it was the Renaissance drop. So it was like new artwork. And we, we put that over the top and repurposed the hoodies and sold those out. So we've, we've done some things like that as, as of saving inventory, but we're not like right now, we're not scared of, uh, not scared of getting burnt on having too much of something, but we've gotten really good at our formula of ordering the right amount now. So we're pretty spot on. But with the hats, like having the numbers on the back, the 009 on the back, you can't resell that. So when we do a pop-up, maybe the first ever pop-up, we'll have everyone that comes and be like, hey, you can get stuff that you will never be able to buy again that's left over from these drops and, and sell it that way. Um, but we're not crazy concerned with, with making those dollars as we are building the brand right now. But that will probably be something that we'll have to think about when we go to the daily sales model, yeah. Mm, long-term vision. All right, man. Well, listen, it's been great really to get to know who you are. And you're so early on with Carte Blanche that uh, I wanted to get an episode in with you now um, while you're starting to build out the brand so that hopefully in a year's time, we can look back on this, maybe do another episode and check in and see where you're at. What's the plan for uh, the rest of this year in Q4? Sweet. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was awesome. That would be cool to do like a updated one in a couple of years if it all works out. But um the, the plan for the rest of the year is get ready for this um, this 10th drop, which will be middle of October, which will be the first one we bring in some uh, cooler uh, weathered items for the year. Um, and then really get ready for that daily sales model after Black Friday and, uh, and make sure we execute that properly. And, and I'm saying this now, if we don't feel like we have it down, we'll just move it to later. We're not in a rush. So um, mm-hmm. really focus on that and, and perfecting these plans. One final question, sorry, for you. Um, you're really busy, as you said, with many things going on, but you're building a brand that is, the, the value of the brand right now is based on the drops and the creativity behind the drops is what sells, ultimately sells the drops. How, how do you find time to be creative um, is my first question. And the second part to that question is, how do you know when to stop and say, that's it, that's the idea, that's the concept? press the green button, move forward, and let's look at the next one. Yeah, it's good that there's me and Adam because if not, things probably wouldn't happen, but we're able to both pick up the slack when the other person's busy. Um, but being creative is is something that I, I try to do a lot. Like I'll, when I first get to the office every day, I'll always look at our designs to see if anything comes to mind. And then Adam's doing that. Usually he's more of a night person, so he's thinking at night. But um, we just really put a focus on that. And, and I think being creative, you can be creative outside of work and always just thinking of ideas and they'll just pop up to you. And then knowing when it's right is we usually have a vision for the product of the design we're going for before it's made. And so it's more of just knowing when they get there versus when it's right. Um, and that's something that we're really good at, at knowing when, it, when it's going to sell good and when, it, when it's the right design. 
we, we know almost instantly and, and 99% of the time, Adam and I are both like, yep, there it is. At the same time, there's not a lot of disagreements there, which is, which is pretty cool. All right, man. Where can people get at you? And do you have a favor to ask from any of the listeners? No, I mean, no, no favors at all. Just uh, carte blanche supply on Instagram is the first thing I would ask before you would even follow me. Just follow carte blanche. But if you wanted to follow me, it's Lewis Leidenfrost on, on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. Enjoy that. This episode brought to you by Sendlane, brought to you by Rewind. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show and in the middle of the show, please check them out below. And uh, if you see Ecom Gold on social media, please like, share, follow. See you next week.